Chapter 31, Sandra Monk, The Infant and the Family. We will be talking about um, developmental changes from ages um, 1 month through 12 months. Promotional of optimal growth and development, we're going to talk about biological development and also proportional changes. Um, as far as proportional changes, the child will double in their birth weight by age 6 months and triple in their birth weight by age 1 year. And these are important concepts to remember when you go into clinical. Their height will increase by 1 inch per month times 6 months. And so a child that was 20, month, 20 inches long at birth is going to be somewhere around 26 inches long at 6 months. And you'll see children grow in spurts rather than gradual pattern, and this continues throughout childhood. But a young infant might sleep more, and they might eat a little bit more when they're growing. They nurse, you know, more frequently. Maturation of systems, um, we're going to uh, look at some of the changes. There's a slowing of the respiratory rate uh, and of the heart rate. I would encourage you to look in your appendix in your, um, in your book, in your textbook, and there should be um, normal vital signs in there as well as normal percentile for their growth and uh, for their height and for the weight for um, different children so that you can see what's normal while you're in clinical because you'll may not remember you know all of that you want to look it up um, also there's hematopoietic changes or blood changes um, in the child you will see um, the, there's like a physiological anemia that'll occur somewhere around three months as the mother's fetal iron stores run out and the child's um, you know manufacture and um, um, you know metabolic uh, response have not picked up yet and so um, you, you see they'll check it out but you know they kind of expect that that will happen somewhere around three months they'll see just a slight you know drop in the uh, in the hemoglobin uh, head growth um, we will measure a child's head and also their chest and their length when you're in clinical. Uh, you'll need to know about the closure of the posterior and anterior fontanelle, fontanelles. And as you will recall from OB, um, the posterior fontanelle will close somewhere around 8 weeks, could be 3 months. And the anterior fontanelle should be closed by 18 months. So a child older than 18 months, you would not need to uh, assess their, you know, their fontanelle. But it would be something that's a way you know, we can tell if a child uh, maybe is um, dehydrated. Uh, differentiation of the nervous system. You know, we continue to look uh, for normal reflexes in the child that they are that they are developing uh, normally, um, so that we can see that their nervous system is developing. Uh, the child's uh, digestive processes continue to um, develop through infancy. Um, late in infancy, you may see a child that's, um, as they're eating more and more solid food, you may see some of that pass through in their stool, and that's normal. If you saw like peas and carrots, if you fed them whole peas and carrots at the end of infancy, because their um, their digestive processes just aren't as developed as they will be as they um, grow into childhood. Um, their um, uh, immunological system continues to develop up to about the time that they get ready to go to school so that's why little children are sick so frequently their you know their immunologic system is not uh, they have some protection from mother but then in, in infancy um, they're um, you know less um, you know more likely to um, you know have uh, less immunologic um, support or protection uh, thermoregulation child they uh, a young infant they're um, they follow if they're in too warm of a room, they're in too warm clothes, they're, um, they will pick up the, you know, the body heat. So we want to be careful not to overdress a child, an infant, um, have them in too warm of an area, a warm car, um, you know, on the beach unprotected or outside of the shade. So you want to make sure that they're not, you know, too warm, too overbundled even in the winter. And then, and then also in cold weather, weather too, they're, you know, they need, you know, some protection and need to be kept, you know, um, warm enough. And then maturation, their renal uh, function continues to um, to develop, and also uh, increase in auditory acuity and perception continues to develop um, through infancy. Fine motor development: uh, a child that is two to three months old will grasp something just reflexively. Um, then they are able to grab uh, intentionally grab a hold of an item at five months. They're able to transfer an object between their hands at age seven months, and they have a pincher grasp, which is the grasp between a thumb and a finger, by age ten months. And they can remove objects from a container by age eleven months and build a tower of two blocks by age one year. And you should know these. Um, these milestones. It's important to remember these.
Gross motor development, a child gains head control by age, head and shoulder control by age four months and up until that time we need to be very protective of their head. Uh, baby should never be shaken um, because it does cause them to have um, hemorrhages inside their brain. Um, a child can roll over by age five months from their abdomen to their back and from age six months from their back to their abdomen. Now a child may be able to roll over earlier than this but it's accidental. Uh, when they raise up their head, their head's heavier and it causes them to be able to roll over. A child should be able to sit up by age seven months and although it's just for a brief period of time and they may be leaning and they are able to sit up better by the time they're nine months old. At least, um, and then they can move from a prone to a sitting position by age ten months. So all this is moving towards being able to get up and walk. This is head lag. This is what a child under four months into uh, A. This is what, that's maybe about a six week old baby, four week old baby. Uh, and then the next one is probably about a four month old baby who's able to you know, maintain some head control. And then the next one is, uh, is a baby that's even a little bit older. Uh, this is a little baby that's just learning to raise up their head and getting head control. Maybe a four week old baby, uh, uh, four month old baby and then a six month old baby there. And this also shows gross motor development. Maybe a six week old baby in A and B is probably about a two or three month old baby. C is probably about five months. D is about seven and I would say E is nine. And I'm guessing on those but I, I think I'm pretty close. Um, and this is a child that's learning to walk. I think I skipped a slide. Okay, locomotion. We go from cephalocaudal direction of development. So we go from head to toe and also we go in sequence. All humans go through this sequence. Uh, crawling from ages six to seven months, creeping at age nine months, walking with assistance at age 11 months, and walking alone at age one year. Now children, this is they're all individual. So some children may walk at 10 months and walk with assistance at nine months or, walk, or not walk until they're 13 or 14 months. It depends on the temperament of the child, how they develop, because we're all um, very uniquely and wonderfully made. Um, the gross motor development, this is a child that there's a child standing up with some assistance, a child pulling up by themselves as they will around nine months and there's probably 11 month old and number D as they are starting to walk with some assistance and there's a child beginning to crawl in E probably about six months and then F probably about nine months beginning to creep more. And we keep skipping past, okay. Now these, I want you to know the psychosocial development and also the cognitive development. So as far as psychosocial development, I want you to know Erickson for each age as we go through the developmental stages. And the first one for an infant is developing a sense of trust. An infant's trust that their comfort needs will be met through feeding and stimulation. They're totally dependent on uh, you know, adults to care for them and therefore that is how they learn to trust when they're responded to. When they cry, they are communicating with us. Mistrust occurs when gratification of needs is delayed. It's never you know, good for a small baby to, um, to cry for an extended period of time. They need to be comforted. There's some reason why they are crying. Now, young infants may cry for, you know, several hours a day. Sometimes they, you know, as they're learning to, they're expanding their lungs, they're learning to communicate. So there's like a period of time in young infancy where kids will cry more. And um, that is just kind of, an, of a natural, you know, happens all babies everywhere. Um, social modifications, um, children need to have boundaries and learn, um, you know, learn um, limits even as an infant so that, you know, certain things you cannot grab a hold of and, uh, you know, some things that are hot, things that are dangerous, you know, pulling plates off the table and that sort of thing. And then biting, you know, infants need to learn that, you know, that may be very satisfying and interesting to them, but it's not a socially acceptable behavior. So children need to learn limits and uh, a child under the age 10 months doesn't really know what no means. Sensory motor phase under cognitive development, according to Piaget, happens from birth to age one month and begins with the use of reflexes and then moves on to more purposeful movement. Even though it may not look purposeful from one, one to four months, you see the child kicking and waving and examining their fingers and their hands and they're learning. You know, they're learning about their own, they're learning about, you know, self-concept, they're learning about their body. Uh, and then ages four to eight months, they begin with a secondary circular reaction where, th where movements are definitely more purposeful and they grasp things intentionally and they, you know, move intentionally. They will imitate vocalizations from adults. 
uh, play is their work. And we're going to talk about different kinds of play when we get to toddlerhood, and uh, it definitely helps children to learn, develop, you know, fine and gross motor skills, how to communicate, you know, how to be social. Um, affect, it, the, our affect definitely um, communicates to children uh, what we're feeling. If we're frowning or, you know, upset or happy, uh, they definitely will perceive that. And then coordination of secondary schemas are as the bits of information that, you know, children, as they learn, we learn in chunks. And so those chunks of information, you know, a child may understand more than they, you know, even before they begin to speak and they understand words more as they're beginning to develop the language. Development of body image, a very important concept with that is object permanence that occurs somewhere around 10 months. Um, and then the development, and that is where a child realizes that, you know, something that's hidden away uh, is not really, you know, hit, like they'll look underneath a blanket for a ball or if mom, you know, put something behind her back, they'll look behind their back. And so they realize that, you know, that things move, that, you know, that there is some kind of relationship there. And so as so a normal you know, a milestone that every child goes through. Development of body image parallels the sensory um, motor um, development. So as they're learning to explore their world, they learn about their body image. Um, the anesthetic and tactile experiences are children's first perceptions of their bodies. So as they begin to, um, you know, experience things that are pleasurable or they experience, um, you know, different uh, consistencies, different, um, you know, surfaces, you know, different things feel different ways, um, they begin to, um, you know, learn about their, their own bodies. And then by the end of the first year, the child's recognize that they are distinct from their parents. And there's a child that is developing their body image through, you know, just, you know, playing with a variety of toys with different textures and um, shapes. Um, social development, attachment must occur with the primary caregiver, uh, usually the mom, but can be a father, can be a grandparent, can be, um, you know, can be another, um, another um, responsible adult. And if that, then they attach first with that parent, and but then they will begin to attach with people inside the home. And then outside the home, by the time they get ready to go to, um, by the time they get ready to go to school, then they, you know, are, um, you know, uh, getting into relationships with people outside of, of the, the primary caregiver. And then reactive attachment disorders when that does not happen, and that can happen for a number of reasons. There's, you know, mom is ill, the primary caregiver becomes ill, or the primary caregiver is not able to care for, you know, the child for some reason. Um, then the child can, you know, begin to, um, you know, not develop. Uh, socially because of that uh, primary attachment did not occur and that needs to be intervened with professional you know help uh, to be able to help that family to be able to reestablish you know attachment and you know reestablish a close family relationship. Um, separation anxiety um, occurs somewhere around four to six months um, and that is when you know they realize that they are separate from their parent they don't really like that um, and even into toddlerhood, you know, they're going to be very attached to their um, primary caregiver. Stranger fear occurs somewhere around eight or ten months, and that is when kids, um, you know, realize that this is not a primary caregiver, this is not a family member, and it's somebody strange. And so they, you know, um, can begin, you know, they get really, they can cry, um, be, you know, not be very cooperative during examination or during vital signs. and. It's just a matter of talking to the child and you know, comforting the child, and that usually works, but it depends on the temperament of the child, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit more. We talked about it in the first class, and we'll talk about it a little bit more here in a minute. Um, and then language development, we know it's very important that we that we talk to children, that we read to children, so that they learn um, uh, language that, that just doesn't happen on its own. And so this is something that is a human-to-human -human, um, type of uh, you know practice that has to happen for them to learn uh, develop a vocabulary and to be and children who do not have that experience you know do not do not do as well in school and then play is children's work we're going to talk about that more in toddlerhood uh, and here's a uh, physician uh, responding to a child who has um, uh, stranger anxiety and one thing I didn't mention is like you know when you go into clinical you don't want to get right into the face of a baby it's particularly our child particularly as they are uh, experiencing separation anxiety or uh, stranger fear um, it is a good thing to um, 
you know, get on a child's level, but it's not always a good thing to, um, you know, be right in their face. Okay, temperament. We talked about this in the first class. Uh, infants, it's the infant's behavioral style. There's a very strong biological component to this, but it can be modified by the environment and family. For example, the difficult child may require more comforting, patting on the back, holding them, uh, you know, to get them through, you know, certain procedures and examinations. Now, we don't want to refer to them as a difficult child. We want to call them less predictable or intense you know, to avoid negative labels because the parents may think they have a difficult child and I think that, you know, kind of uh, reinforces it and so that's not a good thing for the child. The slow to warm up child, uh, we know that this is going to take a little extra time with this child also and it's just, you know, going to be a matter of, you know, the parents being there and parents always room in, in in the hospital or they're always invited to room in in the hospital when they're in the hospital so you'll find that and, you know, like if when childs are getting, um, child's getting vaccinations or something we want the parents in there so that used to not be but we want the you know want the family involved in care the easy child is a child that you want to um, you know you got to pay attention because they can kind of be forgotten about particularly in a home where there's a lot of children um, it, so if a parent has just a very laid-back passive child and maybe they're not gaining weight as quickly as they should or um, it might be that they just need to be on a schedule and you know need to make sure that this child gets you know equal attention and so forth as everybody else in the family. Uh, coping with concerns related to normal growth and development, and we already did, fear and separation of strangers, alternative child care arrangements, um, parents um, may need coaching through this that, you know, uh, we need to make sure that people are interviewed um, before they um, take their children to child care, they need to make sure it's a reputable licensed place. Um, family and friends need to be, you know, credible um, if they're going to keep their child. And so the, um, parents sometimes need to be, you know, coached through that. And you see all kinds of different situations, you know, family members who take care of children, you know, um, daycare um, who take care of children, uh, parents who work opposite shifts. So you see all kinds of different, um, you know, child care arrangements. And when you're, you know, working with families, you want to find out what those are to see if there's any way you can help with them with that. Or when you're giving instructions to make sure that, you know, that communication takes place with all of the caregivers. Uh, we said, already said we've got to set limits and provide discipline. Uh, thumb sucking, finger sucking is something that little babies, infants just do. Um, it's not necessary to, you know, some people think they need to put something bitter on their thumb so they don't suck their thumb and so forth and that's not really necessary. Um, it's not necessary for a kid to have a pacifier but it's, and uh, in fact they've determined that, you know, that may be uh, an indicator of um, or may be helpful in preventing SIDS death, a child that's sleeping on their back and using a pacifier just for sleep for that, um, that it, it is helpful. Uh, pacifiers are also used for non-nutritive sucking, as you may remember also from OB for children who need to be comforted, very young infants um, who maybe are getting heel sticks or other um, you know other procedures. They put a little sucrose water on the uh, on the pacifier, and it it provides some comfort and pain relief for the child. Um, teething occurs somewhere around six months. Kids don't usually teeth earlier than that. Parents sometimes think they do. Um, children who are running a fever and drooling uh, at a very young age that's probably a sore throat or some other uh, some other thing going on. Uh, children don't usually run a fever when they teeth. If they do, it's just something's going on at the same time, or have diarrhea when they teeth. It's usually something else going on. Um, teething to soothe teething you don't really need a lot of medicine or anything could sometimes give a little Tylenol um, for for pain um, some parents think they need to like break the gum the tooth through the gum that's not necessary uh, just a with uh, a cool um, teething rings is something that is the most helpful sometimes uh, parents will let children they use like a teething biscuit those need to be used with a lot of caution because they can can be a choking hazard um, as far as infant shoes, children don't really need a lot of supportive shoes. The grandparents may think they need high tops because that's what they, they had for their children. But uh, American Academy of Pediatrics just said a nice soft shoe doesn't have to be a you know, real supportive shoe when they're babies. These are more decorative than anything else. And when they start walking, they can just simply have like a, a regular, um, just a little athletic shoe is fine. Uh, promoting optimum health during infancy nutrition the first six months of life human milk should be the only food they don't really need extra water they don't 
and as far as formula, there are plenty of babies who have developed quite well uh, with formula, so it is a matter of choice, although human milk is the most um, most recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics. I do have a statement that's uh, posted in D2L. You might want to read that, but um, that is a very important concept. The second six months, we begin to start with um, solid foods. Very seldom are they offered before six months. Sometimes the pediatrician will offer, will say offer cereal for a child that has reflux. Um, and sometimes they'll, you know, a, a child that's not satisfied with breast milk but really need to work with a pediatrician on that. Um, introduction of solid foods um, can cause, um, you know, allergies. That's the, you know, the reasoning or, you know, could be um, some food allergies from that. Uh, when we do introduce foods, we use fruits and vegetables first. We introduce foods one at a time. Uh, we also mix, you know, cereals are one of the first foods, and then meats and eggs are added at the end of the first year, and this is one of the discussion questions that y'all may answer too, so there's a lot of stuff in the book on that, and also from that American Academy of Pediatrics um, statement on breastfeeding. As far as weaning from the breast or bottle, it begins first with, you know, offering with, from a cup around six or seven months, either breast milk or formula, and um, uh, you know, by the end of the first year, a child is probably eating three meals a day and some snacks, you know, and then, you know, milk or breast milk, and then a bottle at night. And then somewhere around, you know, a year, you know, children generally wean, although some parents, you know, tend to nurse, you know, for a longer period of time. Sleep and activity, sleep patterns vary among infants, a very young infant around, you know, one month or less, they're probably going to sleep. They can sleep 22 hours a day. It just depends on the kid. Some kids may stay awake most of the time. It just depends on the kid. And by age three or four months, they should be sleeping through the night between nine and 11 hours. Maybe still taking a couple of naps a day. You know, not even long, 30 minutes to an hour, something like that. Breastfed infants tend to waken more uh, often. Um, by the end of the first year, they're probably just taking one nap a day. And then infants are just naturally, you know, they're naturally active, and particularly when they start creeping, crawling, and walking, they require constant supervision. Um, so a lot of people will use walker swings and play pens. They're not really necessary as long as they've got a safe area to crawl and creep through without, you know, you have to definitely have to baby-proof things. Um, walkers are not considered generally safe because they can tip over easily. Um, swings and play pens are um, safe if they're used and supervised. Um, particularly like a child that, you know, be a child that's more intense or a more intense child uh, may, you know, respond favorably to being uh, swung or rocked. They may like that motion and it may help, you know, soothe them some. Um, but a child should never be left, you know, unsupervised with any of those types of um, equipment. Dental health, um, mater uh, the mom, the parents definitely um, are the ones who supervise and who are going to ones who are going to begin um, with um, helping the children with their teeth. They begin cleaning their teeth when their first tooth erupts somewhere around age six months and they begin that fluoride also. Um, and then for, as far as prevention of dental caries, you should not have bottle propping, no milk on the bed, and no fruit juices. And so little babies don't really need fruit juice. I mean, if the doctor recommended it, they were having some irregularity um, or something like that, the doctor might recommend it. But even for a small child, they shouldn't have more than about four ounces a day. And they, that should never be put in a bottle and particularly given to them in the bed. Um, and I think I, well, I didn't say it, but you will continue to supervise a child brushing their teeth into their, um, you know, early childhood. Uh, motor vehicle safety. We said that motor vehicle accidents are the leading cause of accidental death. So we want to make sure, you know, up to about, you know, one year, you know, um, and then from age one to four, it's the number one reason. Car seats should be in the back seat of the car and facing backwards under 20 pounds. Hypothermia can result from overdressing. We said that already, not overbundle the baby. And so these are just kind of things that you can tell, you know, easy things that you can talk to parents about. Uh, just observe when you take the kid out to the car to go home. Is there a car seat in it? Is it set in there properly? Is it an old car seat? All those sort of things. And, um, you know, the nurse should just, you know, think about, you know, things about safety in the home. Is there a fireplace? Is there, you know, what, are there steps? You know, all those kind of things. There needs to be an assessment. Um, you know, other children in the home, you know, uh, 
does, it, does the kid have child care? So it's just good things to assess and just kind of be aware about the child. And then your know, children who have chronic health conditions, uh, it may be that the nurse would help you know, advise or find a place for CPR. Here's a child that's properly seated in the back seat of a car and um, all it just needs to be tethered down properly if grandparents have you know used the child care seat or uh, relatives or a babysitter I uh, need to make sure that it fits properly in their car as well um, oh that's the colic call okay the colic is paroxysmal abdominal pain it happens in 15 to 40 percent of all infants uh, there's therapeutic management um, for that um, and it, it, it basically is just comfort care. Of course, they'd check the kid out to make sure he doesn't have something like biliary atresia or something like that if they're having this paroxysmal abdominal pain. But it's usually self-limiting and um, you know just kind of comfort. Um, you can hold a child, pick them up and hold them. That's comforting. Um, a child uh, sometimes you can massage their abdomen, you know, very gently or. Um, can put um, a little warm um, hot water bottle or heating pad on the abdomen. I'm going to show you um, a colic hold on the next page. Failure to thrive is growth failure. It is diagnosed as being under 5% percentile. Um, and the prognosis is good, you know, once you figure out what is going on, because um, sometimes it can just, it's, um, you know, an in, it can be an organic reason. Children who have cardiac problems, kids who have um, you know, some kind of digestive problems, they, they might have failure to thrive, but it might just be a lack of education. Maybe the parents are not uh, feeding the child pr properly or mixing the formula properly. So bring them into the hospital a lot of the time and you'll see kids like this in uh, on the unit, on the hospital unit. And uh, we'll do a 24-hour dietary recall. We will watch the parents feed the child and make sure that they finish the bottle or see if they're finishing the bottle. We'll see how they mix it. We'll see how they're feeding them solid foods. We'll check out all of that. And then they may be referred to social services and they also may be referred to home care uh, and community. Some of you may have seen some of the, um, the nurses go out and visit children and mothers under age, children under age two years old and their mothers. And uh, we found like in programs like that, that you can get very good outcomes from that. There's the colic hold. Sudden infant death syndrome is a very traumatic thing for a family. I think a family would never be the same. Uh, some of the risk factors are maternal smoking, uh, co-sleeping in the bed, sleeping on a soft surface, um, items being in the bed, loose items being in the bed. And uh, one of the chief places that you see that is like in the newborn nursery. You see everything in the world in the bed. So oh, let me go back to page. And uh, so some of the protective factors, uh, we make sure that the child sleeps on their back. There's like a back to, um, back to sleep program uh, since 1992. Um, infant risk factors, um, you know, low birth weight babies. Um, we've already said, you know, some of the other things. So we really need, you know, like the, the family, you know, are going to need a lot of care at the hospital uh, when they bring the child in. They're going to need a lot of care when they go back home. And so there's going to be referral to social services and also to um, grief um, and bereavement groups. Uh, positional phagioplasty um, or phagiocephaly, excuse me, um, occurs when uh, children, their head becomes misshapen and some of this can be from the back to sleep, you know, if their parents are just leaving them on their back. So we want to encourage them to put them on their front to play and also that they get some tummy time every day. And so this is something that even a physical therapist might do this, um, you know, with a child that has, you know, cognitive problems, but it's something parents do with nor children who are developing, you know, normal cognitively. So there's like little play sets you can buy at Babies R Us, but you don't really need anything but a, you know a blanket and a firm surface um, to do this and um, you know just make sure that they're you know getting on their their stomach some every day um, some other things uh, like with the um, uh, plagiocephaly is uh, they would be worked up they would be you know see if you know ma make some changes like you know when you're holding the child make sure you hold them in different positions um, and so forth uh, this keeps skipping on me okay um, and then uh, the therapeutic management, they would wear a little soft helmet um, and they wear it except for, you know, to get a bath every day and then, you know, just for, for several months and until their um, head, you know, begins to get back into the, you know, the proper shape. There's one. Parent life-threatening event is an aborting 
could be considered an aborted or near miss SIDS. The parents would bring the kid in and say the kid's not stopped breathing or not breathing. And so uh, all, all of these kind of events would be evaluated. Um, and it, you know, you may find out, you know, small birth weight children, um, you know, that tends to be, or children, you know, who've had some other kind of complication, like meconium staining or something like that, may be um, more likely um, parents who smoked, smoking in the home now. Um, and so some of the things that they can do are theophylline and in addition to education with the parents, theophylline and caffeine to stimulate the child. Uh, they may be on a home apnea monitor. That might be part of the diagnostic um, follow-up. Uh, and of course the family is going to need support in addition to, um, to CPR um, training. And here's a child who's got on one of the uh, monitors.